Thank you, Mati. It's always so hard to speak after her with so much energy, perfect English, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so welcome everybody who is, uh, you, know, well, you know, joining us back at the AC. Uh, super nice to uh, have you here. I see Ven that I saw beautiful pictures and it's always fantastic. And I'm very happy to, to see many uh, old friends and familiar faces, uh, but here at, at the AC. So, so great to have you. Um, I'm super excited to first of all uh you know welcome you again to the uh, fourth iac alumni global meeting and i'm particularly excited to welcome to iac uh, to marcia sad which is uh, first of all a great friend uh an absolutely brilliant architect but also uh an iac alumni she joined us if i'm not mistaken marcia 2010 2011 you did the master in advanced architecture as well um that was the moment I kind of left IAC. I moved to the US, so I missed uh, Marsha uh, on that kind of like period. But I have been very fortunate to have Marsha to be uh, the coordinator of the Master in Advanced Ecological Buildings and Biocities that we run at Baidaura for a couple of years where her contribution was uh, phenomenal. Uh, you know, I managed to really know her in detail and has been an absolute uh, kind of like pleasure. Since then, I have the chance to follow uh, her amazing career. Well, I think I'm, I'm, you know, particularly jealous. I have to be, you know, honest. You know, it's uh, uh, an absolutely great plethora of work. Uh, she will show us today many of the amazing things that she's uh, doing there in her practice, um, together with uh, us, Rafi and Sat Design, uh, that they have this uh, wonderful design office that has been really doing very cutting edge work. Um, also, I'm very kind of proud of half her, uh, you know, lecturing for us because again, um, one of the particularly amazing things about IAC alumni is that it's a very diverse um, um, kind of alumni in the sense that you guys feel many different roles, many different profiles in the kind of professional community. This is not just a school that is generating one type of architect for sure. But I think Marsha uh, to me represents core values of this institution, uh, doing always innovative stuff, never you know, being uh, okay just to deliver in whatever project, just to keep the office running, but really squeezing every single opportunity to really uh, innovate as we will see in many, in many of the projects. And I have to also maybe acknowledge that, you know, as you would see, she's innovative, she's making high use of computational design uh, techniques and many of the things that for many years we have been teaching at IAC, but she's also trying to really very much contextualize that in questions of place, questions of, of, of space, in some other cases of gender. So I think um, she's a really, I think to me, you know, a great example of, of some of the, you know, wonderful professionals and, and human beings that are somehow uh, trained or that we contribute in the training of uh, here at, uh, at IAC. Uh, needless to say that Marsha has thousands of awards and publication and all that, that's given almost for granted. But, you know, I have to, at the very least, uh, acknowledge that, you know, her curriculum is pretty, pretty impressive. Marsha as well, besides, you know, joining us for a few, uh, few years here at the Barcelona and, and teaching with us and coordinating the, the Master in Advanced Architectural, uh, Master in Advanced um, Ecological Buildings and Biocities, she has been also teaching in a couple of U.S. Uh, universities, University of um, of Portland in uh, no, University of Oregon in, in Portland, in the School of Architecture and Environments, and in, in the School of San Diego, if I'm not mistaken, San Jose. I'm sorry, of San Jose. Um, so you know she crosses uh, the world and you know teaches across the kind of like uh, time zones and i'm sure we will convince her to you know bring back uh, some of her talent and also you know keep uh, doing some some teaching with us here at the act because it's always uh, fantastic to have her around so um without further ado let me briefly introduce the topic of uh, marcia's lecture she will be uh, lecturing today about transformative spaces. We are very intrigued about the title. We love it very much, where she will be talking about how to combine, you know, um, structural inquiry with uh, high performance, uh, you know, architectural uh, systems that, again, as I was mentioning before, are very much rooted in uh, questions of place and context. So she's bringing, you know, high a global expertise, but really trying to contextualize and apply uh, locally. So Without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming our fantastic alumni, Marsha Saad. Thank you so much. Uh, you, you don't need it, no?
Can you hear me okay? Great. Well, good evening, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, let's change the slide. I'll use the mouse. No, it's in the presentation. Sorry. What is your question? He pushed the arrow. <laughs> well, um, so good evening, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk about my interests and share my experiences with you. And I'm really thankful that there are so many like-minded people here in this room who are also passionate about these things. And because of this, I would like to hear from you first. So tell me the key issues that drive your design decisions. You can shout them out. What do you care about? A few more, come on. <laughs> the algorithm. <laughs> well, even if you're not saying them, I hope that you just think about them a little bit, kind of hold them close uh, during this presentation. Um, <clears throat> because I think that any of these approaches that we heard, they're all equally important. And they grow from our diverse origins and experiences, and they always result in different types of outcomes. But they're all rooted in a passion that we all share, which is how can we have a positive impact on our buildings and our cities and just make things better. My talk tonight is a reflection of my personal experiences, so I might not include those issues that you care about. And because of this, I invite you to reframe anything that is shared tonight from the perspective of your own expertise and create your own narrative around it. And I hope that you could take that in a direction that's valuable to you. And maybe if I'm missing something super important, we can have a discussion about it after. I want to present the talk tonight as an evolutionary process of problem solving from the statistical to hopefully the profound. I will share how I'm continuously developing a problem solving structure to facilitate the design process. Um, because I'm always struggling to give organization and direction to the creative process, because the design has to come from somewhere, not from thin air. And then when I focus on that too much, I realize that my work is missing some magic. And then I start to think about what design has to offer in terms of a more sensitive inquiry into impacting our environments. Anyway, um, that's what I want to talk about. It's hopefully going to be a reflection on the parallels between the technical and the human centric domains. So first, let's look at that original foundation, that formula which guides the design process. I think that in this lecture hall, it's not such a challenged philosophy that new technologies and digital tools offer opportunities for integrative design solutions that benefit people. This was also the bedrock of my design process to use an associative algorithm that incorporates various data inputs to create a complex design engine which drives the design. And for me, this is really valuable because in that case, the project outcome is not centered on my human subjectivity, but rather on organizational structures. So then let's use that foundational formula to look at the first inquiry that I wanna to share tonight. And that is, how can we, as designers, retool technology, innovation, and industry to create spaces that are more responsive to the users that interact with them every day? And we can look at a, gener a generic project as a case study, a public space with different characteristics, users, activities, data layers, and relationships. And through those data layers, we can identify agents in the system. And if we set up the system, it can respond to those agents. So if, for example, the system understands an individual as a potential space reacting to a network of potential spatial assemblies, 
then we can begin to see how real-time data can orchestrate changes in our physical environments by projecting necessary changes in real time. And perhaps if we take that associative algorithm, it can be translated into a type of architectural expression like this. But clearly, as you are not either, I was not satisfied with this outcome. It feels like it belongs in a dystopian film like Blade Runner or District 9. And so I started looking for a kind of integrative formal language to offer some organization and direction. And with a lot of trial and error, I finally realized that we as designers need a kind of synthesizer, like a geometry system that can act as a generative framework. So let's take a look at how a project would look with that. We're still defining data inputs, but in this case, the inputs are translated to a geometric language that defines a generative field, which in turn guides the design. And this was really exciting to me because Following this logic, we find so many possibilities for a geometric framework. It can be adapted to act as a structural system or an organizational system that defines fields of gathering and flows of movement. Or it can unify the formal expression of a project by having an ornamental performance. So with this refined script, let's once again tackle our public space. In this new scenario, we use inputs of roads to generate a geometric field. And it's a public space, so there are other inputs there. For example, there's trees. And again, it's a public space, so maybe there's a stage, maybe there's space that people need to gather. And all of these are, again, translated into a type of geometry that is acting and reacting to the other data inputs that are there. And of course, people need to walk around, so it's good to have some wayfinding strategies. And then the space can start to look like this. So here we can see how that generative system provides an integrative formal language where one single geometry can define places of movement, gathering spaces, flower beds, benches, and all other aspects of a public space. And the moment of this project was really pivotal for me. Because on the one hand, I felt that I had conquered the problem. I could use this toolkit for any design problem. And I mean, just give me a problem and I'm going to provide a beautiful project. But on the other hand, I realized that I'm just not asking the right questions. And as we know, there's nothing worse than answering well the wrong question. In this case, the problem was that I had not been asking any question at all, but rather I was using my formula to offer a never ending string of solutions. And so I started to ask them, and this is where I realized that there are two types of questions. The ones that are very specific to a project that are contextualized in that project. And then there are the ones that are the burning questions of our time. Coming back to those issues which we heard a few of them earlier. For me personally, those questions are connected to community, identity, our environments, and the existing narratives of a place. And so with this new wisdom, I had to rephrase the problem for myself. The, the question is not how do designers retool technology and industry to create spaces that are more responsive to the end users, because I shouldn't be thinking about an end user. I should be thinking about a community. And I shouldn't be thinking about needs. I should be thinking about their aspirations. And so now I'm finally ready to offer an answer to the first inquiry in the context of this project. This is the Berianak Metro Plaza. It was a project led by my partner, Raha, and which was completed sometime during the cloud that was the pandemic. 
The realization of the plaza came as a result of the Baryanak metro station. You can see it in the middle of the screen. The plaza is located adjacent to a major highway on the east side and then a very densely populated neighborhood on the west side. And there's other infrastructure like the bus station drop off. And it's obvious from that site location that our biggest design challenge was related to high noise solution that swamps the site from the highway. We started by using our computational skills uh, to do some real-time data mapping of noise levels in different locations at different hours. And then based on those inputs, we were able to identify the points in the site that had lower sound pollution or points where the sound was generally canceled out by other infrastructure. But we also studied various techniques for creating sound barriers which also included specific trees, because as we all know, uh, the canopies of trees also act as barriers, but also these systems that you see here. And finally, we combined several techniques. We placed trees directly off the highway, and we took advantage of that four meter direct drop, drop on the side of the highway while incorporating a soft incline off the neighborhood side where the traffic is slower. But that's the technical side or the computational side. Um, for this project in particular, we reached out to the community to hear what people from the area wanted from a public space. And we talked to different groups, so mothers, um, parents, working parents, children, teenagers. And what we learned from them, the mothers said that even if we have a public space, this area is just not safe. And so I'm not going to let my children play here. And a lot of the working aged men said, I don't need a public space. I need a place where I can rent and afford the rent for retail and commercial work. And the teenagers all said, we don't have a place to meet people and hang out. And we don't have a place to do the things that we like to do, like skateboarding and basketball. So we tried to solve those issues. And this time we used simple common sense to respond to those issues. Uh, so here are those public spaces. And what we did was we surrounded each public space with small retail units that could be affordable for the community to rent. And with a variety of options being like small cafes or retail shops, these small units could act as passive security for the public spaces so the kids could play. And all the feedback that we got from the teenagers and the young folks in the area helped us to understand the need for very vibrant and colorful spaces with opportunities for different sports and games, which we then spread out through the project space. We were able to give them the skating rink that they wanted. And I'm really happy to say that the basketball court is always being used. I visited the site on the day that I was flying to Barcelona and the space really looked like this. This picture is not from that day, but this is how the space was. So I think that not everything about the project was a success, but people be playing basketball here. The big win for us in this project was that the neighboring community are now shareholders in all these microeconomy retail spaces. And as well, that we were able to use our skills to solve problems through design innovation. And together with the teams I worked with, we were able to design and construct many projects with this approach of identifying a geometric language to create a generative system that integrates any data input or design criteria when providing solutions. Until we had a project where it didn't work. So, here I present to you a typical housing design problem in Iran. Take any design, any design on a residential building site in Iran, and let's watch it get destroyed. The first problem is the neighbors. So all the houses, re residential housing apartments in Iran are north-south facing, and then there's always the neighbor to the west and to the east of that completely adjacent to it. So you don't have any space to build anything or interact with the space around you. And then the second problem is real estate. And I don't think that this is just an Iran problem. I think it's an everywhere problem, but 
With residential projects in Iran, 30% of our time is focused on design and 70% of our time is focused on maximizing sellable area for when the project is finished. And then there's the issue of security. So no connection to the city on the ground floor. There's still more. And then there is the culture of privacy because in Iran, uh, we're not really used to opening up our homes for people to be able to see inside. And so take any design, it starts to look like this. And that's how it makes our cities look. So even though we have these really big windows, the curtains are always closed. And as you can see from our cities, housing design provides no opportunity for formal explorations. So I realized that there's something missing from my toolkit because clearly the answer is not a geometry system. But meanwhile, I arrived at a new inquiry, which is how can we define a language of expression that communicates with identity and individuality? And to answer that, let's look at the Alley House. The Alley House is a multifamily housing apartment that's located in a very conservative city. For anyone who's Iranian here, it's in Rome. And our challenge was to reinterpret what a modern lifestyle can be in a highly religious environment that is rooted in privacy and just being concealed. So first we looked at that typology that we're seeing all across the country. And what we realized with irony is that those big windows, which are heavily curtained all the time, actually necessitate the need to be veiled. But if we could somehow rotate these frames that you see so that they no longer face the public domain, well, then we could actually liberate all who lived inside from having to be concealed all the time. But then we were faced with the problem of an entirely closed facade. And we were thinking, well, how can we make a facade that's completely closed be vibrant and reflect the culture and identity of that city? Of course, the answer was brick, brick everywhere. And being innovative young creatives, we found an opportunity to once again retool innovation and industry to explore new solutions with old systems. And you can really see that expanse of a brick that is completely closing the building off from the public domain. But at the same time, it engages us because of that patterning technique and how we use that patterning technique to create window apertures where you can see outside from within, but you can't see within from outside. But there's also that in-between space that resulted from the turning of the frame. And it's within that space that all the beauty of an open and liberated life can be found. So I think you're catching on, but we were just identifying material solutions for the problems in this project. And to create spatial identity in different places that we were trying to achieve, we uh, chose different materials for those spaces. So for the shared areas and the access points in the building, like the parking lots and the entranceways, we were looking at um, more urban materials and industrial materials. And so you can kind of see how that looks like in those shared spaces uh, on the ground floor. But we had a really different approach for the inside. So as much as we were trying to close the outside of the building from the view of the public view, on the inside, we were really trying to achieve connection and brightness. And so we used materials that were really soft and warm and neutral with maybe some hints of those urban materials where the rotated frames were. And here you can kind of see how all of that works on the inside. So it's not really connected to the city, but all the spaces are really connected with each other. And I really like this photo. I think it's one of my favorite moments where all these different materials are coming together and where all of our thoughtful constructs are aligning to create a serene and sympathetic space. What I learned from this project is that materiality and texture are important tools to create connections. They affect our senses and they change our perception of space and they often move us in ways that we don't expect. 
on their own materials don't evoke identity, but they do create associations. And when those associations trigger our emotions and create feeling and meaning for us, it begins to relate to identity, and then it begins to connect to our inner worlds. And so I had to revise my toolkit. Now I have two options for a synthesizer to unify that associative algorithm. I can either use a geometric system or a material system. But at this point, I arrived to a new dilemma in my professional life, and that was, how can architecture reveal itself as a place for stories where we don't focus on the building, but on the life and experiences it frames? Technical issues. And to contextualize that inquiry, I would like to present to you number nine of. So, this project is premised in the fact that the spaces that we live in and we're active in create a sense of belonging and identity. And if they're built well, they can lift us up and empower us and inspire us and make us feel valuable. And if instead we defer to the bare minimum of code in generating these spaces, you know, the minimum that you need or is required for them to function, then we're actually disempowering the people who engage with them. And this impact of place on people is something that we experience every day. And we actually move around to navigate how any particular place makes us feel. And we wanted the project that can enrich daily life. So we asked ourselves, what characteristics do our environments need to have for us to feel good? And the answer to this question, even though it feels redundant, is equally complex because we know that we experience our environments through our five senses, our feelings, our memories, good or bad experiences, we're all registering them through our bodies. <whistles> Understanding that a place is magnificent, awe-inspiring, dark, cool, all of that is understood through our proportions to that space and through the relationship of our bodies to that space. Or how the types of materials that are used and their arrangement related to each other, their color, does it connect with our heritage and our origins? Does it make us feel like we belong to that place? All of this is understood through our body. I think that this image for any Iranian like feels super, super Iranian. And if that space impacts us, whether the experience is positive or negative, it's recorded as a memory. If we smell that smell again or hear that sound again, it takes us back to that space and that time and the feelings that we felt then. So to answer the question of what do we need in our environment to feel good, the answer is whatever we come into contact with daily that impacts us on the scalar relationship with our bodies, it must inspire our senses, it must reflect who we think we are, and it must connect with our inner worlds. To explore that principle a little bit more, let's zoom into some aspects of this project, the stone envelope, for example. In using this precious material, stone, in our project, we took two decisions at the same time. One was to celebrate the material in its most raw form, where the size and cut of each piece informs the size and the cut of the next piece. And through that, we can also develop our own relationship with the tactile experiences of the material. But on the other hand, we took the decision to offer an architecture that is, in essence, unfinished. There's an exposed steel structure and a simple unadorned raw cuts of stone with no special form or precise placement. In essence, it's incomplete. We thought that with an architecture that never seems to be quite finished, any sort of life, whether plant or animal or human, can complete the project through growing and changing and adapting the architecture every day. 
So quite literally, the building frames the life and the stories that take shape within it and lets life be in the foreground. And that's where we found the second alchemy, the natural environment. We know that natural environments invigorate us and that the nature of any geography is also part of its heritage. In this project, we also carefully considered trees and plants that are indigenous to this area in Tehran, as well as natural elements that also relate to our sense of identity. So in the image, the entrance is flanked by these cypress trees, Cypress trees in Iranian Persian culture are a symbol of everlasting life. And if you look at the entrance, those hanging plants are jasmine, the smell of which we're, are always referred to in every poem in Farsi. For us, this project was an experiment in the promise of things that are left unfinished, because what could be is always so much more suggestive than what is already done. And unfinished architecture reveals itself as a framing of our life stories, stories of the people who live here and the experiences that began to shape the building. And also, the design emphasizes an architecture that's understood not by what we can see, but what we feel through touch, scent, and sound. So, so far we're seeing how material and geometry systems are combining with interests and environments and identity and community to offer up solutions. But experience showed me that there's still a missing link in this formula, which the next inquiry revealed to me. And that's that how can we use innovation and engineering to celebrate a sense of place and existing narratives? And with that, I'm really proud to introduce you to the project of Jahan Fulad Industry Headquarters. This building was bought by the owner of a steel holding company uh, to be used for his industrial activities and office spaces and also different types of commercial spaces that he had. The building is an existing building. It was built in the 1950s by a Swiss company and the origin story of the building is also quite interesting because it used to be a granary, a grain storage facility for livestock, which was uh, the grain was distributed from this uh, building. And another thing that is kind of special about the building is that it's already it already has a huge presence in the area. It's the one tall building in this neighborhood. And because I'm going to come back to it later, I just want to point out that the three bottom levels of the building are aligned with the urban skyline. For us, this project was a study in liberating architecture from following particular building types or design expectations. Instead of a iconic for uh, formal architecture, our goal was to make the design so transparent as to frame the people, the industry, and the activities that happen inside it. You can kind of think about it as a new twist on the Centre Pompidou approach, where instead of glorifying the trappings of architecture, we were trying to celebrate and frame the human presence and history of the building itself. So just to kind of introduce you to the design, uh, this is the building before we started. Uh, it's a view from the east side. And here's the design adapted to it. The levels which match the surrounding skyline are heavier and they're kind of closed off, which reflects the formal language of the area. But then there's a block of green that separates the lower levels from the upper transparent levels. And here's the view from the west side. The masonry in the lower levels also has another reason. It's not just to match the urban skyline. There's a lot of industrial activity that's happening on those levels. So if we had a very light and transparent uh, facade, there was a high possibility that something would break it. And you can kind of see how it is in the environment and how we tried to in integrate the design with the environment. You can see the industrial areas and the green roof and then that transparency that we were trying to achieve in the higher levels. But in the design that I showed you so far, we're ignoring a huge problem. 
And that problem is this three levels worth of concrete grain shoots that are completely closing off these floors of the building. The client wanted to demolish the entire mass and construct new floors, new floor slabs for the necessary office spaces that he required. And so we were faced with a concern. How can we identify a technique which will allow us to provide the necessary requirements for the client, but not lose the valuable existing narrative of the building? And finally, the technique we identified was a judicious and formally suggestive subtraction of the concrete core. To give you an idea of how that would look, um, this is the future restaurant space in the building with the concrete shoots that you can see in the ceiling. And this is what that space would look like after the concrete extraction and design construction is complete. But our problem didn't go away. I think some of you might have identified it. When we look at this concrete mass like this, perfect and rhino, it's so nice and isolated and contained. In the physical world, there is so much going on here. There's the existing concrete structure, there's existing building slabs. And so the question was, in all of this mess, how can we find a benchmark from there to start mapping the coordinates that can actually guide that subtraction process? And we realize that step one is that we need to put the core extractor machine somewhere. So wherever we start, it's got to be on a landing. And then the second simplification was to identify sections where the subtraction can happen chronologically. And finally, that helped us to realize that there's this one point where this mess is intersecting each other. So if you look on the second landing from the top, there's one corner which intersects with the column, and that corner also, if you project it, intersects with a point on the concrete core. This is a big deal, you guys. It took us a long time to find that point. So with this point, um, we were able to identify a benchmark that we could use um, to create a system of intersecting contours to locate the other coordinates that we needed. And this is that same system, if you look at it from underneath, where you can see the mapped points and the coordinates relative to each other on the table. But part A was the easiest section. If you look at section B here, um, you can see that those lines aren't parallel anymore, and they're starting to change in the X, Y, Z direction as we move from south to north. And because of that chaos of mapping each point relative to the point before it, we realized that we have another problem, and that's that we had to develop a system of cross checks um, because you don't want to find the second point only based on the point before it. You need to find a way to make sure that that next point is the right point. This was pure joy, of course. <laughs> this is kind of an overview of how all of those drawings would work. So what we realize is that if we look at the elevation of the closed subtract, the core, concrete core that we need to subtract, then we can map some coordinates on it. Based on that, we can identify where the cutting lines need to be. And then we can locate a point on the floor slabs where we can start that uh, demolition process. And then the last thing that we had to do, which was also the most difficult for anybody who's working with an as-built building, is to synchronize all of these drawings with the actual as-built structure. But that leaves out the actual process, which I will explain now. So we want this curve. But we can't have exactly this curve. We have to start with an approximation of this curve. And then we refine the rest later. But don't forget that that's not what this space looks like. It just looks like this big concrete block. So we have to step by step map these coordinates as we're moving forward from the landing and then start this core extraction and then keep moving down until we finish execution. And here you can kind of see how that mapping would look like on the wall. And uh, further points. So the extraction that you're seeing here, that one line, we actually made a mistake. And then we realized that we were extracting everything wrong, so we had to remap everything. And uh, on the top right, 
uh, you can see one of the core extractors. So this one was a handheld one, but there was two of them. One of them um, was actually a heavier machine that could do work a lot faster and it was more heavy duty. And uh, you can see that in the bottom right. And also something that's kind of important to note here is that as we moved forward, we would leave the landing. So there actually wasn't anything underneath these planks. They just connect directly to the restaurant two stories below. This core extraction process took eight months. We're past this point now because these photos are from last fall. Now the edges are smooth and refined and we're starting the process of revitalizing the space for functional use. I'm not sharing any photos of that because the construction site is always a nightmare and it looks horrible when it's done. This is what it looks like if you're looking down and then on the right image is what the space would look like when you're looking up. I want to take a moment to recognize these three key individuals in the project. They each have teams who work under them. And of course, two of them work for us and one of them works for the contractor. So there's also a lot of people here that deserve recognition that are not in the photo. But these three are important to me and especially for this part of the project. The gentleman on the right, Said Fard, he was the person who did all of those uh, computational coordinates and identifying how we needed to do, um, basically demolish this building, uh, this part of the concrete core. And the woman who is on the far left, Naba Hulusi, she is our supervisor, our design supervisor on the site. So she basically lives in the construction site. She's there all day. And she was the person who mapped uh, all of these coordinates onto the building. So she was one, sometimes she would be 50 meters above the ground on a scaffolding, like marking these points. And the person in the center, Mr. Parmar, he was, uh, he and his team basically led the demolition and core extraction process on the project. I really love this project because for me, it's a perfect example of how we can take advantage of innovation, technology, and computation, but not just to be forward thinking or show off, but instead to celebrate those intangible aspects of design, like the heritage of a place and existing narratives. But this project also offered me with the system that I was looking for because I realized that it's not a geometric system or a material system that I need. It's, that's not what the process is, but actually it's a whole system that needs to act as a synthesizer. So geometry and material and technique are always informing each other. And sometimes one of those elements takes precedent over the other ones, and then it has to, it kind of dictates what needs to happen with the other elements. So for example, in the, example of this particular project, that technique of being able to use a concrete core extractor took precedence over everything else. So if we could not use this technique to create that geometry, we would have to change the geometry. So this is kind of where I am right now with this structure, which informs the design process. I'm not going to talk about it anymore for tonight, at least but of course it's still developing. And what we're seeing here isn't even a complete overview of how this really works because I also teach, I've been teaching for seven years. I also do research projects. And so each of these fields are also informing the other field. If there's something that I'm working on in research, I take that research into my classroom and I work on it with the students. And then things that I learn with students, I take, what I've learned into my professional practice. So all of this is always um, informing each other. But that's a talk for another day. Keeping that design framework in mind, I have one more project to present tonight. And along with that project, a new inquiry, which it created for us to explore, which is how can design offer a space which encourages us to explore our imagination and find our whimsical self. To contextualize that, I would like to present to you the Carthage National Museum, 
This is a project that was commissioned by the Ministry of Cultural Affairs of Tunisia. It was a proposal for a tender. This project required a reinvention and expansion of the current National Museum of Tunis, which is on the Acropolis of Bursa. I haven't showed this to anyone, by the way. You're the first people to see it. So this site um, encompasses many traces of many different civilizations. There's archaeological ruins from the Phoenician and Punic era, as well as the Roman era. There's a footprint of Catholic influence that you can see in the cathedral and the seminary. There's also a UNESCO plaza because this is part of a World Heritage Site. So there's a lot of things happening on this site. And one of the big issues, well, we had two big issues on the project. The project brief required that we keep in mind that there's an anticipated 2 million annual visitors for this project. And at the same time, um, the ministry wanted to expand the museum spaces for their exhibits. So if you see the blue, which is the cathedral and the um, seminary, that's where the current uh, National Museum is housed, and they wanted to expand that. But there was also other things that they wanted. They wanted the project to be a landmark in the city. They wanted it to, any design response to kind of be in harmony, of course, with the existing um, uh, heritage of the site, but then also be very forward thinking for the future. It was really important that whatever we built on the site would have a very light footprint because it's a very important archaeological site, so you can't just build on it. But at the same time, they wanted the project to also reflect identity and be a gateway to the historical site from the UNESCO Plaza. So we had a lot to think about. <laughs> And we realized that we also have a different kind of problem. And that's that on a sensitive world heritage site where you're really trying to contain people, how do you contain 2 million people who are going to visit it annually? And then how do you guide them through these different domains and civilizations in an organized way? How can you actually curate that experience for them? And we finally were able to come up with a method to resolve all of these issues by basically creating a museum wall. And that museum wall, first and foremost, acts as a gateway from the UNESCO Plaza, which is a space that's accessible to everybody, to the World Heritage Site um, after it. But what was really exciting for us is that we could also use this museum wall to basically create an experiential loop where you, through that loop and through the wall, you're constantly moving through different exhibits and then you're suddenly outside and you can experience some of the environments that are related to that exhibit and then kind of loop back in and that way really experience the whole space. And then we realized that we could take that even further because there was a temporary exhibit and a permanent exhibit. So what if we could create different types of loops where you're always kind of guided through the space and you're always engaging with the museum wall and that's kind of what is directing you through the spaces. And so that's what we were ultimately able to do. So just using this one element, we were really able to organize the different flows of people that visit this area, whether they're the visitors or the people who work there, or if they're coming from a comp for a conference, everything could be kind of channeled through this museum wall. But we still needed to find a formal language for the project. And so for this, we really started to study the environment and look at the language of the environment. What do the trees look like? What does the landscape look like? But also, what are those artifacts and how are architectural details connecting with those artifacts? And also, how users are engaging with the space. We use this image a lot to take design decisions. 
And what we realized is that the site is really, really horizontal. There's a horizontal language in everything that we're seeing in the podium that exists there, in the views and the vistas that are happening. And this horizontality is punctured by small vertical elements, a tree or an artifact, a sculpture. And we kept this elemental language in mind and we started to consider how we can have an architecture that's recognizable from, this, from the city, from anywhere in the city. But it also had to be something that was subtle and respecting the context and honoring the language of the context. And we took this really elemental language and with it, we defined two planes, one that was vertical and the other horizontal to outline the architectural scope provide enclosures, offer protection and shade through the canopy. And these two planes are sometimes legible together, but sometimes they're understood as one plane and one line. And sometimes they're understood as simply two perpendicular but disconnected lines. And they're the lines which frame the views and define spaces and highlight existing artifacts and natural elements. They're abstract, simple, timeless, imposing. But we also considered how materiality can allow us to be introspective and imaginative with them and allow us to offer a new perspective of everything that we're experiencing. By reflecting the existing environments, we could see archaeology from a different view. And then depending on where you're positioned as a viewer and the angle of reflection, some things are concealed or revealed to you and understood in this physical way, but then also reinterpreted in an imaginative way. So, in execution, we attempted an architecture that's in fact invisible, but instead it reflects the environment and the experience, the things that we can discover, but also ourselves. In this museum environment, we were, are not just observing whatever is there, but we're also observing ourselves and the impact of our presence on the environment. You can see how the museum wall reflects what we can see in the view, but also things outside the view, like the hills in the distance, or some gestures of the archaeology site that can be seen in the canopy. And the canopy and the wall also frame the view to the bay. The canopy was our opportunity to explore complex engineering with minimal structure that also echoes nature and hopefully quietly integrates with the landscape. We had to calculate how the columns could be positioned around the ruins so that, the, um, so that we're sensitive to the archeological elements. But we also create an illusion of a forest that rests on a landscape. In this project, we were really fascinated by the opportunity for visitors to explore and experience time from small moments in a day, a reflection in the architecture of a cloud passing overhead to transformations which take decades to be realized. We chose materials that we hope are at once timeless and enduring, but also transform in response to natural stimuli, allowing for new explorations and revelations with each new visit to the museum. To end this talk, I want to offer an inquiry for us to take into the future. And to do that, remind yourself of the answers that you gave to the question at the beginning of the talk. And if you're willing, close your eyes or turn your look inward to reflect a little with me. Take a moment to think about this room that we're sitting in and the building that it resides in. Center yourself in this space. Think about yourself. Would you consider yourself young or old? Curious or experienced? How do you know yourself to be different from the people that you interact with every day? Now consider the social part you're playing by being where you are. Think about your impact on this room, on this building, and the impact of the building on you. 
think about the future of the building, what you want for it, what you want for yourself from it. Now, look back to decades before. Try to imagine the people who were here in this hall, in this building. Imagine their impact, their identities, their aspirations. Try to include them in your story of this space. But now, go even farther back to before the building existed, before the institution existed, before the city existed. Imagine the people who crossed over this land, who lived here, and not just the people, but the trees, the animals, the birds, who are also all a part of it. And if your eyes are closed, please open them now. And let's explore this idea that if our collective values are substantiated through the places that we invest in building, then how can design present opportunities for transformation? How can we include everyone in that frame? Not just everyone, but everything, plants, animals, and the health of our planet. Thank you very much. Marcia, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, it's one of the most uh, carefully crafted and prepared lectures I've been uh, in the recent time. So beautiful, not only the work, but really the work on, on, on presenting. So thank you for, for doing that for us. That was really, really amazing. Um, so um, I'm sure Mati will have a question, but somebody else as well. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty sure about that. So um, floor is open. Absolutely, please take the opportunity of, of asking Marsha at all levels. I think she gave us quite a lot to think about, uh, but as well, you know, uh, you are more than welcome to, to inquire about, you know, how somebody that has stayed some time uh, here uh, gained some knowledge, some expertise, and how that, you know, has been playing in many different ways uh, throughout her uh, fantastic career. So floor is open. Otherwise, I will have to give it to Mati. So please. Uh... You can ask me about anything. What's it like living in Iran? Political, social questions are also welcome. I'm game. Ah, come on, guys. I mean, you're never shy. So, OK, thank you. Hello, first of all, uh, amazing presentation <laughs> uh, here. Uh, no, I, sorry, I know that you're there. My computer's turning off, but go ahead. Uh, um, the museum, the last one of the heritage, um, I saw that the intention, like it, you put it a lot of glass because the actual landscape was more memorable and needs to be actually the protagonist of the space itself. But uh, regarding that this is a place there is going to be a lot of heat, a lot of sun, um, isn't there to be like further do um, environmental analysis to actually see how much heat is going to impact on the people that is going to visit the heritage? What is the impact on the heat that is going to be actually uh, impact on the site, the environmental aspect of the site is, as well. Like sure. if you if you guys are considered this. Yeah, the... yeah. No, don't worry. We considered so many things. Um, I only had forty five minutes to talk, but I could have talked for maybe half an hour just on all the work that we did on this particular project. So environmental analysis was, I mean, how our design is impacting the environment is something that's really really important to us anyway. 
Um, so we were also considering these questions, uh, exactly the ones that you uh, commented on. And actually, the first thing that you said about reflecting the environment instead of having the building be so reflective, I think that that's an interesting point because one other person also said that to me. What we were trying to do with this project was to really celebrate the environment and erase the architecture so that you can't even see it. But then at the same time, as you're seeing everything in the space, you also have a moment to see something from a different angle. And I think that this is something that we always get really excited about. It's like you see the thing, but then you can see a projection of that thing as well. So that's to answer your first comment. But about your second comment, we were also really worried about this. We did some environmental analysis. I can't say that we solved everything, but one thing that's important to note is just the orientation of the wall. The wall is actually north-south facing. And so the most time that it would be under the sun is when it's uh, sunset, basically, and no other time during the day. So it's not a space that is continuously capturing heat and giving it back to the environment. Um, of course, as it is reflective, it is it would reflect that heat. But because of the building orientation, we were able to minimize that a little bit. But then there's another thing to kind of uh, pay attention to, and that was that we found a place in the project that had the least footprint. There was already other buildings around it. And so almost half of the building is actually falling under the shadow of other buildings that are there. So that was another thing that minimized it. There are other uh, ways that we managed to tackle this issue, but I'll leave that for later. We can talk about it. Thank you uh, for a fantastic lecture. Um, and also I like this honest, um, let's say, um, feedback about how much an algorithm can help us to resolve an architectural questions, you know, how we can design our building. And, and, and you clearly show the limit there of uh, uh, this algorithm will not solve everything. And we have a lot of question now. Is machine learning will help us to design better. And you kind of scale back and say, no, no, look, we have tools as an architect. If you listen properly, if you understand the scale of the material, of the people, um, having intention, and I think your lecture was beautiful, especially in IAC, uh, where we tend to fall in this trap of like technique being a fantastic element. Um, you propose a kind of framework to a conceptual one of how to approach this um, that could be looked as if it was an algorithm, but I think it's a set of tool to a designer of how to approach this, no? Um, and I understand that you teach as well um, those tools. And I'm wondering, and I believe you had to do it as well with your team uh, when you work with them, no? And I, I would like to understand um, how succeed, uh, how do you succeed, not maybe not like, a, like an algorithm, but like a, a set of design rules or tools, um, accumulate um, experience and knowledge uh, about how to approach an article topic and how you share this to other people and also how um, do we transmit this learning if technology helps you there or not uh, how do you embed this this knowledge or this framework into something that help the next generation uh, because i believe you had to do it a lot i'm wondering this thanks um yeah that's actually not an easy thing to do that's uh i'm sad to say that a lot of that is just experience, but there are a few things that we can fall back on and which I try to teach also. So if you have a really large project with a lot of environment around it, so there's a lot of space for you to do things. Um, in my experience, identifying the various data inputs and one thing that we always do is if you just look at the environment, there's a lot of indicators that are telling you things about what type of formal solutions you can find. I think in the last project, we showed that example. Um, those types of projects always work really well with a geometric field. So when you implement that geometric field, what's really great about that is for those projects, we actually use a lot of Grasshopper because you can you, you have space to kind of navigate different data inputs and then translate them into a formal network that will then drive the solutions. And we really love to not be the decision makers and like develop a system that makes the design. Um, 
but then there's times when the scale just doesn't respond or there's just too many things happening around it. And I think that what the in those moments, the clear fallback is, OK, let's look at materials. Let's look at the types of materials that we can use that um, can create those systems for us. And then another thing is um, just general knowledge and know-how, like expertise that exists within a, a specific project site. A lot of the projects that I showed now are in Tehran. There's a lot of people in the industry who know what they're doing. We don't have the best tools to build, but we have a lot of people who know things. But if you move away from the capital, a lot of the labor is very specific. Like you have to follow the techniques that people know how to use there. And so because of the geography of that project, you know that this is the moment where we need to use a technique and let the rest of the project grow around that. So these are the things that, again, from experience I've learned with students, to be honest, like I always communicate that generative uh, framework that comes from geometry. Geometry is really easy for everybody to understand and it's a really good starting point. It's where I started. Um, so when in doubt, find the geometry. Yeah, beautiful. Um, so, I mean, this is like it's just begging the question. So, I'll just ask it. I'm I'm scared. No, no, no. So, so there, there's a there's an interesting thing where I think we all have this idea always of authorship. So, part of the whole computational thing is to kind of step away from authorship of the design itself and then develop a process, so on. So I'm interested on your take on authorship in two ways. One, one is the authorship between the author and the project. And then the other thing is how do you, because you've been saying we, 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 unlike a lot of architects who say I, I, I. So how do you do the we in the design decision process and making in, in the project? So these are the two main things. I struggle so much with the I, I, I. I can't do it. I mean, I'm showing you work here, but this is... This isn't just me, there's so many people, there's my students, there's my team, there's my collaborators, there's random people that just managed to be on the project for a short time that I learned from. It's just so, so, so many people. Um, and then there's also all my mentors, you know, thank you to Areti, to Vicente, you know, to all these people who taught me so many things. So um, I, I can't say I, even if I just did something completely alone, there's the, I mean, there's always the we. And one of the things that I actually struggled with a lot in this presentation was that I wanted to note all the people who worked on the different projects. And I was like, this is just going to fill up all the slides. Like, I can't do that. I need to keep things simple. Um, so thank you for asking that question. Thank you to everyone who helped me with all of these projects. Um, yeah, really. <laughs> Uh, but about the authorship of um, the designer related to, to the project, I think that well, the designers are always driving the projects. Like there's that moment where you're just taking the decisions to make something happen or not happen. And so that authorship always exists. I think that what we try to do is to just set up things in an objective way as possible where that authorship can be shared less just by the people, but through the inputs of the project itself. And I saw you get the microphone, but also through the participation of the communities that are part of the project. So a lot of times I, I didn't show so many of our public domain projects, but we have a lot of public domain projects and that there people really care about the spaces that they engage with every day. Um, and the more that they're part of the process of design, the more they have a sense of ownership and belonging to the project. And when people have a sense of ownership and belonging, places stay nice. If, if there isn't an owner to a space, even if it's a public domain space, it just starts falling apart. And so that's another um, thing that we really try to engage people in that process to kind of give it back to them afterwards. That on being objective. No, so I get that fully. So one more question, because uh, somebody has another one. Um, sometimes the context doesn't have to be very material and pragmatic. Sometimes the context is immaterial, like a political context in a place like Iran. So how would, I mean, 
can you just walk us fast on how would you respond to that through architecture and if architecture needs to respond anyway to a political context in the first place? Um, I will try to answer that. I, I like to think of myself as an architecture activist. So I'm not just an architect, but I'm an architect activist. Um, so if you ask me this question, I say that architecture always has to respond to uh, geopolitics, social politics, social economics. Um, and actually one of the things that I'm faced with every day now, being a woman designer working in Iran is um, that these tropes or these ideas, they make a big difference. And you there's this moment where you just have to take a stand on everything. And that is always informing architectural decisions. And it always has a big impact on our spaces. So we have to do it. I hope I answered your question. Short and sharp, so perfect. Um, more questions? One more here. We will get maybe a couple more questions and then maybe drink some beers, maybe. Yes, good. Hello. Hi. Uh, this is Faizeh. We met before, um, like, previous th uh, Thursday in studio. Oh, I remember you. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me. Um, as an Iranian woman, first of all, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> and thank you so thank much you. for sharing uh, all of the projects and everything with us. Uh, there is a short question. I want to know about the steel factory, steel office you, uh, uh, you've did. Mm -hmm. when, um, what was the emphasis that you didn't demolish that thing? And because you said it took like eight months to work on it. And why didn't you, I mean, uh, why did you cho to choose actually to redesign it? Yeah. You know, that is such a good question. I'm loving these questions. What we realized afterwards, like after we did this uh, course subtraction, is that we really helped the client. We saved the client so much time and money by using that subtractive system instead of just demolishing the floor slabs because they would have to use a very similar system anyway, and it would take more time. And then afterwards, they would have to rebuild this, uh, the floor slabs. And uh, it would cost a lot more money also because they would need to bring in all of those machines and everything. We were doing things with like a small team making it happen. Um, so we actually saved the, uh, the client money and time by taking that decision. But the reasons that we took that decision really come back to the fact that we realized that this is a very special place. I think that if we did something completely different, we would have still had a good project. We're good designers. We think about things. But at the same time, that building is just that building. And if we didn't recognize that and acknowledge that and look for opportunities to celebrate that, it would be lost. And we'd have a new building, but it wouldn't be, it would lose that legacy and that heritage. Fantastic. Um, we will give the Last word, last question to Michael, and then we'll thank you, Marsha, and drink some beers. Thank you. Marsha, thank you very much for your talk. It was lovely. Um, I also have a question about the factory renovation. First off, I think the uh, moment when young architects or architects in training realize they can create space through subtraction rather than addition is an awakening for a lot of people. So. Yes. Most of us also look at the opportunity to do that at a high rise scale concrete block if we're seizing the <laughs> Did you do anything intentional with all of that matter that was removed? Or if you didn't have the opportunity, can you speculate on maybe what you would do with it? No, we did, we did. I'm loving these questions. So the thing is, because you're using a concrete core extractor, like all the things that come out kind of look like this. And we had a whole bunch of them and they're really cool because they have like, I mean, I don't have, I'd have to find a photo of them, but um, they're concrete and then they have like pebbles in them and it's just a really cool texture and they all have this like cylindrical um, shape. We saved all of them. This project uh, has an entrance and so we needed to um, design a, a fence for the entrance and we're going to use all of that uh, concrete that we extracted to kind of create that wall 
Um, so it will be the whole north side of the, the site, which is a sizable amount of space. And we're going to use it there. Great answer. Very awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so just to close up, uh, Marcia, thank you so much. Um, I know uh, Roland uh, Bart like you know declared this death of the agency and and the death of the author. Um, I still feel that's not completely true. I still recognize a lot of things of Yak in your trajectory, and I feel that we can explain some of the meaning of your very successful work through understanding you and understanding you know the influence that also this building and the people that you know once was here and still are here have had in you so um, that's really um, meaningful to me and very impactful so um, together with that I want to thank you again for the beautiful work beautiful presentation and you know we we are very much looking forward to have you closer and closer to EAC uh, as time uh, passes by so um, thank you all uh, thank you Marsha and please join me in uh, Big round of applause to Thank you. Thank you.